Here we are, I'm starting. Um, bonjour tout le monde, je suis Pamela Isfeld, la présidente de La Paz, et je vous souhaite la bienvenue au déjeuner de La Paz. We are here today. Um, I am chairing this meeting uh, from the uh, unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. And I acknowledge them and respect, uh, acknowledge and respect them as the past, present, and future guardians and caretakers of these lands. And I ask that all of you take a moment uh, just to think about where you are joining us from and uh, what that what that means. Um, who who used to be on the on the land where we live, work, and play. Um, so I am very happy to be here with uh, Doug Janoff, who is a Foreign Service Officer, a member of PASO. He joined the Foreign Service in 2009, and he's had postings in Washington, Afghanistan, and Islamabad, as well as numerous uh, postings at, at headquarters. I believe, Doug, I think we first ran into each other when you were in the Human Rights Division, if I remember correctly. It's That's a, right. I think, and I was working on Middle East stuff at the at the time. Um, Doug has uh, agreed to join us today to talk about his book on queer diplomacy, which stems from the research that he did on his PhD thesis. So, I mean, it's a it's a very interesting book. It's a, a strong contribution to knowledge, and also, you know, it's very interesting from the point of view of LGBTQ diplomacy and activism, but also a pretty interesting, just general kind of window into to the work of a foreign service officer, you know, people working on multilateral issues and trying to advance things. And also people, you know, blending in many cases, uh, like a personal sort of interest and personal identity with um, the work that we do. So I am going to stop sharing this little screen, allow Doug to share his screen. While Doug talks, I'm going to uh, turn off my camera, but I will be here. I'll be watching for comments and questions in the in the chat and unless someone has a sort of a hot pursuit um item we will take questions at the end so um i'll keep an eye on everything but um, you know don't be don't be wounded if uh if you don't see your questions sort of uh, being addressed right away we will do them we'll do them at the end and i'll offer you the the chance to speak if you if you want to come come up to the panel and talk about your question so uh the la plupart de la présentation sera en anglais mais vous pouvez poser des questions et faire des commentaires dans la langue officielle de votre choix. Merci. So, Doug, over to you. Great. Um, can you see my Can you see yes. my screen? Okay. Yep. And you can see me. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, so, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, uh, I just want to. Um, uh, thank uh, Pam and uh, the PAFSO team for um, for for inviting me to to speak about my my book my research. Um, je suis un, un, un membre très fier uh, de notre uh, association et, um, ça, et, et avec grand plaisir uh, je suis ici pour. Um, Pour appuyer les les efforts les efforts de notre association um, et vous pouvez uh, également uh, me poser des questions en français si vous voulez um, uh, although um, the I, I've done this presentation quite a few times and it's early and I'm only on my second cup of coffee so I will launch in English. Um, and I'll start by showing you here the uh, the cover of my book. The full title is Queer Diplomacy, Homophobia, International Relations, and LGBT Human Rights. It has a foreword by Victor Madrigal, who is the UN um, uh, independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, whom I had the pleasure of working with um, for the four years that I was doing human rights negotiations in Washington at the OAS. So I was working as a senior um, officer at the uh, at our mission to the OAS, which is co-located in the embassy in Washington, D.C. So um, just want to start by uh, 
giving you just some very basic uh, uh, basic overview on what is queer diplomacy. So uh, we start with uh, World War II and how the world order changed. And so basically um, what we what we see is that um, uh, certain Western liberal values, including democracy and human rights, um, were uh, began to be promoted much more directly through multilateral institutions and processes. And since 2010, a lot of these Western governments have embraced LGBT rights more assertively as a foreign policy objective. And this um, occurs both uh, uh, bilaterally and multilateral, multilaterally. And so, and 2010 is an interesting date because that happened to be the year that I, I showed up in Washington and I was quite struck by how uh, LGBT rights was being um, uh, focused on in, um, in the fora that I was working in. Um, and this was a particular interest to me because before I joined the department, I was a researcher and had already published a book on um, homophobic violence in Canada called Queer Diplomacy. I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> called Pink Blood. I'm getting my books mixed up. Um, and if you want any information on my background, uh, you can go to my website, which is queerdiplomacy.com. Uh, and I will show you the um, the URL uh, at the end of my presentation as well, again. But that has everything about me, about the book, and about my previous book. So, turning point 2011, uh, Secretary of State, U.S. Secretary of State Clinton goes to Geneva and does a speech at the Human Rights Council where she says gay rights are human rights. And in many ways, that was a watershed moment because um, it was sort of this, uh, of course, a lot of work had been done before that. And in fact, if you read <laughs> um a uh, bout papier uh, this month is going to be um, doing an excerpt from my book. And in that, I talk about my involvement as a queer activist in back in the 80s when these discussions were first taking place. So you can, there I was marching in front of the UN as a, a young activist in my 20s. And then there I was like, you know, 25 years later, um, a little bit um, paunchier, wearing a suit um, and at the UN doing interviews for my PhD, which ended up um, forming the basis of this book. So what I'm trying to convey here is this arc of, um, of uh, a development of a discourse on LGBT rights. It didn't just start with Hillary Clinton saying gay rights or human rights. There was a whole history that came behind that, which I talk about in the book. But in a sense, it was like a crystallizing moment because it was like world leaders had, I mean, they had, she was the most powerful woman in a political situation in the world and she was saying in an international forum gay rights are human rights and so i my feeling is that even even if you didn't agree with it you 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 had to agree that this was now on the table this was now an agenda and on the agenda and it had to be um it had to be taken seriously so uh, really this book is about um, what that LGBT diplomacy does. So it generates conflict between Western allied states that support and promote LGBT rights and the states that continue to oppose LGBT rights and criminalize same-sex conduct. So um, 
this book is about how that diplomacy happens. And I say a new queer diplomacy has emerged from the triadic interaction between states, intergovernmental organizations, and civil society organizations. So this is the, the uh, diagram which explains this dynamic. And this was what I observed when I arrived in Washington. When I arrived in Washington and I was working at the OAS, there were these LGBT uh, uh, human rights um, groups that were um, coming to countries that were uh, supporting LGBT rights, such as Canada and the US and saying, you know, you need to push more for this. And so they were, uh, in a sense, um, focusing on this link between LGBT organizations and diplomats. And then um, the intergovernmental organization, for example, the OAS, was getting involved. So, for example, um, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which was um, an intergovernmental organization, was putting more emphasis on this. And so um, you would see this dynamic. And I was so shocked when um, I saw, you know, representatives standing up at meetings um, at the OAS uh, that were really denigrating um, LGBT rights and uh, even LGBT people. I mean, it was just, it, it blew my mind that in 2010, this was still going on. So this percolated an idea for me about um, how to approach this issue on um, LGBT rights and diplomacy. So uh, to give you an overview of the chapters, um, and I'm not gonna go into them all, but just so that you see the lay of the land here. Um, the, first, uh, the, the first major chapter, which is the second chapter, is uh, called From Western Deviance to Homonormativity, Theories of Sexuality and Sexual Diversity Politics. So keeping in mind that this was an academic study, which was then turned into a book, you can imagine how much theory there is in it. So the first few chapters is, it is quite theoretical. The second one is called International Relations, Human Rights Diplomacy and LGBT Human Rights, where I'm looking at these attempts to kind of bridge uh, international relations um, scholarship and scholarship on diplomacy with um, emerging um, human rights uh, discourse. The next chapter is called Global Homophobia, Queer Diplomacy and Conflict, which really starts to drill down into this clash um, that occurs when Western, um, when Western countries really uh, promote LGBT rights on the international stage and the blowback that occurs. Uh, the next one is called Researching LGBT Human Rights Diplomacy, which I'm going to talk about more in the next slide. And the mechanics of human rights diplomacy, um, which is really now we're getting into my data, like these interviews that I did, which then goes into a lot of details about how LGBT human rights is promoted in international settings, and uh, I looked at a case study of a resolution at the UN Human Rights Council in 2014 and LGBT human rights diplomacy policy implications. So looking at recommendations after talking to so many people about things that we might uh, consider doing differently. So looking at the research aspect, which will give you a window into how I pulled this off. So, um, basically, uh, this chapter focuses on the epistemological and methodological challenges that, um, that I confronted while doing this uh, human rights research in Geneva and New York. So I 
um, basically used a, a multi-dimensional standpoint epistemology shaped by my own positionality as, so I had three identities, Doug, the academic researcher, Doug, the diplomat, and Doug, the member of the LGBTQ community. And uh, I used participant observation, interviews, and a reflexive narrative format to write my dissertation. And I did 29 interviews with human rights advocates, diplomats, UN officials, and experts to provide insights into the strategies and techniques deployed at the UN Human Rights Council and other UN fora to promote LGBT rights. Whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, so <laughs> this is me in Geneva. <laughs> Um, at the um, on the rooftop of the World Health Organization cafeteria, beautiful view of Geneva. I was there in the springtime. I love Geneva in the springtime. And um, this is uh, inside the um, Human Rights Council um, at the Palais des Nations in Geneva. If you haven't if you ever go to Geneva, if you haven't seen this, it's it's really worth um, taking a tour. It's it's I just find it to be a very uh, inspiring place um, to be <laughs> doing human rights negotiations. Um, these are you know examples of the rooms in the huge old buildings that um, of course housed the old uh, League of Nations. I mean it's it's you know, the environment really, uh, I can't, I, it's hard to describe, but it's, uh, it's almost like a sacred environment. When you think about the international negotiations and the history that that city has um, for hosting people who are in conflict and working through those issues. Um, this was my UN library card <laughs> that I used, um, and I was able to get a sponsorship from uh, a civil society organization to help me through that uh, process. Um, here's an example of the, the incredible uh, architecture. And then I went to New York, and there I am at the UN headquarters. Um, in This is all taking place in 2015. And I'm basically uh, just, um, uh, you can see the brown, tall brown building in the distance is where uh, Canada's mission to the UN is located. Um, that's me with the grades. <laughs> and um, at this, uh, uh, at the headquarters doing more interviews. And this was at, just at the time when the, the, the SDGs were being uh, born. And um, and so I just want to give you a few conclusions and then we'll just open it up for, for Q&A. Um, so I used to understand queer diplomacy, I, I, I theorized it using an interdisciplinary framework consisting of scholarship on LGBT identities and movements, international relations, human rights, diplomacy, and post-colonial analyses of the links between sexual and gender identities and issues such as religion, colonialism, nationalism, and state-sponsored homophobia. I used a reflexive multi-dimensional standpoint methodology, which allowed the author to draw on, the author being me, <laughs> <laughs> to draw on my experience as a foreign service officer, community researcher, and former activist. And these were some of the, my findings. Um, the, the UN related human rights meetings and events in Geneva and New York, and 29 uh, in depth interviews with diplomats, UN experts, and human rights advocates uh, provided. Uh, a wealth of information on the mechanics of diplomacy, the homophobia experienced by diplomats, 
and the techniques that civil society organizations and intergovernmental organizations use to advance their policy agendas in conjunction with LGBT friendly diplomats. And the book ends with a series of recommendations pointing to key themes, best practices, success stories, issues of contention, and dimensions of LGBT human rights diplomacy and activism that are ripe for policy development and further research. And if you want more information on the book, you can go to queerdiplomacy.com. Um, the And I just also wanted to mention that the book is at the GAC library. Um, so that's great. Um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, it's, <laughs> it's $170 per book. So I'm, unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, that's the world of academic publishing this time. So I'm really not here to encourage people to actually buy the book, but to rather to know of it as a tool and um, to be able to find ways to access it if possible. Um, through different ways and through different libraries and so forth. Um, and yeah, so that's a kind of a quick overview. Um, Pam, back to you. No, oh, thank you, Doug. That's really interesting. Can I ask just a technical question? Because um, yes. I'm, I'm not very academic these days. What do you mean when you say multi-dimensional standpoint methodology? What, what does that mean? So, um, this comes from the famous uh, Canadian uh, sociologist, Dorothy Smith, who is like the, the goddess, of the late Dorothy Smith, who is like the goddess of feminist sociological methodology. And she basically invented standpoint methodology as a method. And from that, what she means is that, um, there is no such thing as true knowledge, like this true, pure scientific knowledge, and that that is actually a gendered concept, which cuts away the lived reality of individuals. So, so as a social scientist, I have a duty to actually include my standpoint in um, uh, in my research so that I can freely admit what my biases are because I'm not a perfect person and I am a human and I have been shaped by social forces as I as I grow and so you know that's that's the standpoint part that whole uh, theory was then teased out and when we say multiple standpoint, it's like drilling down even further and saying, actually, I'm not just a woman. I'm not just a lesbian. I'm also white. I'm also um, upper middle class, whatever, you know? So it's like um, uh, using intersectionality as a really active tool to be, um, you know, as as precise as possible when you're doing social research. Interesting. I mean, I remember, you know, discussions when I was doing my uh, my university stuff about, you know, you have to try to find an Archimedean point, right? And, uh, you know, be outside your research and be dispassionate. And then, you know, other discussions about how, well, that's impossible. <laughs> um, right. So yeah, I, I I had not heard it uh, expressed that that way, but it makes it makes a lot of sense. How do people react? I mean, you were presumably you know talking you were talking to your colleagues and different people at different missions and so on. And were um, what was the reaction of you know foreign diplomats, for example, when they found out you were doing this research? Were people in general willing and interested in participating or? How so, that so I write a lot about that in the methodology chapter about the insider outsider dilemma that we that I found myself in. So in some ways, 
there are advantages to being an insider and sometimes there are advantages to being an outsider, right? So, um, so for example, when I was trying to get interviews with um, diplomats um, in Geneva, I would say, hey, I'm one of you guys, you know, like, uh, let me in and give me give me the the buzz, the inside buzz about what you're going through. And on some level, they could relate to me more than if some person was just coming off the street and saying, I want to interview you, you know, mm -hmm. so you have to kind of use your commonality of discourse uh, in order to. Uh, you know, like when you travel around the world and you meet another Canadian, and even if you don't really have that much in common with them, you talk about Tim Hortons, you talk about hockey, um, and you find ways to make those linkages, which are hopefully going to um, create um, links. So, um, so then as a, but then I also wanted this to be a balanced study so that I wasn't just taking the diplomatic point of view. I was, it was interesting because the questions I was asking to diplomats is what is it like working with civil society organizations? And they would go, oh, have you got a, an hour? You know, I've got so many things that I'm complaining about that they do this, they do that. Then I would use my insider status as a member of the gay community to then talk to civil society organizations and say, okay, I'm, I'm putting my gay hat on now. Tell me what it's like working with diplomats. Oh my God, working with diplomats is just so frustrating, you know? And then they would give me the dirt on that. And so by the end of it, I mean, it was just... It was fascinating because I had all this material. I mean, I came back after living abroad for five years and I literally had like 10 boxes of interviews in my, in 2015, when I came back to Ottawa and started working at IOR. And it took me uh, a year and a half just to go through all my notes and process that because you know, the other aspect that was very challenging about this is I was working on my PhD part time while I was uh, working full time as a diplomat. And I would take blocks of time off to to do my interviews and to to write my my thesis and that sort of thing. But um, it was a, it was an intense experience. I can imagine how what was the reaction I mean of IOR were they supportive of you doing this research and and um, or were they concerned about what you might conclude about what how Canada was doing this well so um, if you look at the way that I struck I I was I think and that also goes into my methodology chapter um is it's like, how do I avoid um, conflicts here? Because um, I want to keep my day job, you know. Yeah, it's not ready to be fired just yet. <laughs> yeah, not quite yet. Um, so how do I balance that? And so my supervisor at Carleton, so I did my PhD in Canadian studies part-time. So, and, and if anybody is actually interested in doing their PhD, uh, feel free to send me a, a message and we can talk about it. I would strongly not recommend it for anyone working as an FS. Um, it took me uh, basically 13 years to to do mine. And it was, I, I went through a lot of difficulties along the way. Um, I think there are easier ways of doing it, which I should have done, but I just didn't. <laughs> um, I, and it was, it, 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 I cry sometimes actually when I think about the amount of work that I went into this and the number of summer vacations that I lost and the number of relationships that I lost as a result of focusing on my baby. This was my baby, you know, like I, I, I'm single, I, I don't have a family, I don't have kids. And so this became that. And I, I just feel blessed 
that I had that opportunity and that space to explore this. But um, for people who who really want to have a normal life, <laughs> I would strongly not recommend it. So my Carlton supervisor gave me the best advice. And she said, if you're doing, if when you're doing your research, do something that you can do off the corner of your desk. And she didn't, she didn't mean that I shouldn't be focusing on my work, but she said, <laughs> Do something that you're already doing and analyze yeah. that as opposed to because I was going to go to Venezuela and do an ethnographic study for a couple of, <laughs> people, you know, certain communities or whatever. And she's like, no, you're <laughs> you're 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 beyond that. Like maybe if you were in your 20s and you just wanted to jump off and do something really different, that would be different. But you're a mid-career professional and you're trying to do this at the same time so do what you know which is best uh for you yeah and build so, on some some knowledge and some connections and that you already have that makes sense right and that i already know and that was what was so exciting about this research because i i knew so much of it already i just didn't know the academic term for it you know yeah. um so uh so the other good piece of advice my supervisor uh, gave me is focus on global and multilateral and not individual countries because as i peeled off the layers and got more interested in the cases of lgbt uh, anti-lgbt movements and state homophobia occurring in all these different countries in the world which we we can certainly talk about but we wouldn't have enough time in the day um her point was you're never going to finish like it's just it's going to end up becoming this catalog of a litany of horrors and you're not going to be able to get the big picture so the advantage so the advantage of focusing on multilateral was not only that I could get that big picture but also I didn't have to focus on Canada so this did mm -hmm. not become a critique of Canadian foreign policy or an analysis of Canada's LGBT human rights foreign policy I did have connections. Uh, I'd had connections with LGBT human rights organizations for years. And I was obviously being a diplomat uh, enhanced that. Um, but I, 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 I had a firewall and I did not, um, you know, Canada is one of, you know, 192 other countries that are at the UN. And so I just wanted I wanted to do something that was a, a global contribution and something that would not leave me vulnerable to people in the department saying, you used your position to somehow, um, you know, uh, put, put our country or our foreign policy in a negative way. And I absolutely uh, did not do that. And so, um, you know, so that's how I tried to avoid that, that conflict. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I mean, and that's a, that's a very wise set of decisions, you know, because otherwise you can, you, you know, if you had gotten into a, you know, peeing contest with the department over uh, how these things were going to go, like, you, you know, you could have lost five years dealing with that, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. No, the, the, those are smart decisions. I guess I always, um, so I always like you know behind the headlines type uh, type questions on these kinds of things. And I'm just curious if you're willing to share. I mean, were I know you know some countries, some some UN members are not you as you've mentioned. You know they're they're hostile to these ideas. Did you ever encounter any personal kind of difficulty? Um, stemming from, you know, trying to interview people or other people, other delegations or, you know, colleagues knowing that you were doing this work. And I mean, how, how did that, how did that go? And how did you, how did you handle it? And did you get support from, you know, your Canadian colleagues if that, if that happened? Well, you know, a lot of, I have to say that 
most of this research was actually not taking place. I mean, my supervisors knew that I was working on a PhD, um, but I don't, I didn't share with them the details of who I was, um, what I was doing, what I was researching, who I was, I, it was all very general because I didn't really want to get people involved. I mean, a lot of uh, doctoral research is actually about following certain processes, getting ethics clearance. And then by the time I had jumped through all these loops of doing all my exams and my courses and everything else, I really only had uh, a few months to actually throw everything together and do my interviews. So I suddenly had to just like get on a plane and go to Geneva and just send, uh, you know, tons of, uh, of messages, emails to lots of different um, missions and just introduce myself and say, this is who I am. Would you be willing to talk with me? And um, I mean, if I had been a full time student and been able to move to Geneva and spend two years really, you know, focusing in depth, I think that would have been different. But and, you know, I mean, I, I sent messages to like Canada's or the, the UN mission to the Vatican, for example, and said, I would like to interview the nuncio on, you know, the Vatican's position on LGBT rights. And usually it's just, they don't answer you. You know, it's not like they're, I don't know what their their feelings or their motivations are, whatever. And I didn't want to second guess that. So, uh, but, but in terms of, I have to say, I did meet Canadian colleagues along the way while I was doing the interview process. I mean, I can't always, uh, I can't, of course, say who I was interviewing and who I wasn't, but nothing but the greatest admiration and respect for me for having done this research from um, from almost every diplomatic colleague, uh, both from Canada and from other countries. Nobody um, really ever cast dispersions but then again that's the nature of diplomacy as well right is that you there are polite ways of telling people to go take a hike you know and that is you know you just you don't respond to them or um or you say one thing and you mean something else or whatever uh, yeah. but but this is the this is so this is the the disadvantage to qualitative interviews is that you don't get a really broad spectrum of so there were all these I'm sure there were all these homophobic diplomats out there that I couldn't access because I didn't have the time to cultivate those types of relationships right uh, but and I they were so, hearing about you and volunteering to come and talk to you right you know? yeah so yeah. with qualitative you use you know the um the approach of uh, the snowball method of just slowly making connections and meeting those right people. But in some ways you're preaching to the converted. So uh, th that's the disadvantage. But what was nice about it is then with those diplomats, I was able to, uh, I got a couple of stories from them about homophobia in the, in the diplomatic service in their countries. So, so they would talk to me about either experiences like one guy was a straight diplomat who was telling me about homophobia experienced by a fellow gay diplomat and then uh, a gay diplomat was telling me a um, gay male diplomat was telling me about the experience that that he had had so you 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 find ways to sort of edge your way into those types of things but I I personally didn't I mean I think um yeah I I don't think I suffered personally except for as I was saying you know just my own personal hardships of having to do such a an onerous uh, workload for so many years while trying to uh juggle and manage uh, my my foreign service um, career
Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's, I mean, it, it highlights again, sort of the, the wisdom of the choice that you made, right? Like if you, you know, you're not, you weren't sort of going critiquing the department, but you also were not kind of owned by them in yeah. terms of having the them overly on side <laughs> with what you're doing and, and causing those problems. But the price is, yeah, you've got to do a lot of this on your own, on your own time and dime, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm I'm not seeing any questions. I'm surprised that this group is so quiet. <laughs> so I just want to encourage people to either, you know, you can put up your hand. There's a little hand in the in the um, the bottom of the screen, and I will um, invite you to come up as a panelist to say hi to Doug. Or you can use the chat or sorry the Q and A um, box. I think we don't have chat enabled for um broad things for everyone we sort of divert everybody to the q a because otherwise it can get a little uh chaotic for the for the chair which is me and i don't like chaotic um but i'm just watching to see i'm, I'm i see some people who i know are not shy to ask questions so <laughs> come on rise up <laughs> um but um i did have another well i mean an I, I don't want to get you into territory that you might not be comfortable talking about, but I'm just wondering, you know, from the point of view of uh, somebody, you know, career diplomat who is not a member of this community, but, you know, interested in and supportive of, you know, these, these um, principles and, and activities. Do you have any suggestions? Like, is there anything that we could be doing better or differently as colleagues to support uh, you know, the promotion of LGBTQ human rights and other, you know, rights internationally. I mean, did you, I know you mentioned that the uh, civil society organizations had comments about working with diplomats and, you know, is there anything that kind of came out from your work? Well, that I, I, I mean, that's the nature of the beast. I mean, the, the main objection that human rights, uh, LGBTQ human rights activists had about diplomats is that they're fickle. And that they, their positions change with the wind, you know, and um, or they'll they're two faced, you know, they'll they'll go to a party with you and they'll tell you, gee, I really support LGBTQ rights. I really support your movement. Um, I really want to help you out. But my capital says, you know, we have to vote no on this resolution, you know. And I think part of that is it, it's just the nature of the beast, right? This is this is the structure of um, of uh, the work that we do, and so we don't have the luxury that civil society has of or academics of you know the personal is political, and you know I'm going to speak my truth and. Um, I'm going to hold other people to account who are not able to do that. So there was also, you know, hip, you know, accusations of hypocrisy. This this ambassador is gay, but you know he's in the closet and he, you know, he has a certain private life. But then when push comes to shove and he's on the floor and he has to either support or not support he's always caving in to um, to the needs of the capital. There were other complaints about the arbitrariness of um, foreign policy around LGBT human rights, which again is a broader critique about multilateral human rights or multilateral diplomacy in general. Because, you know, this one, this one uh, UN official I talked to was saying, you know, we had this uh, ambassador uh, from a, from a global South country who was adamantly opposed to LGBT rights, and he was very homophobic in his treatment of the subject, et cetera, et cetera. And then he left, and then from one moment to the next, a woman came in and she embraced LGBT rights. So again, it's this it's this uh, suspicion that that um, you know the non diplomats have, like to what extent 
are these policies that are being preached and promulgated in international fora really the uh, the province of the of the country, and to what extent are they the province of of the individual who may have uh, their own biases which affect so it can kind of go either way they can either be really pro lgbtq but um have to implement uh an anti uh lgbtq message because of their state or they could be really anti lgbtq even though their state is supportive of lgbtq rights so there's a connection there yeah, well, and I mean, I'm also sensitive to the idea that, you know, depending on what we kind of know about people's personal lives, right? Yeah. Sometimes, you know, we're encouraging people to um, be more involved in certain things that, yeah. I mean, when I, um, when I, when, when I was on my last posting in Warsaw, my second ambassador is a gay man, um, and, you know, very open, and we, we all knew this, and we, um, we, we didn't do a huge amount on on LGBTQ rights in Poland, but we did kind of go out of our way to be there for the small groups that were doing things because they were really pressure was really starting to build up with them. And, you know, it was more kind of like, let's do what we can for moral support. You right. know, so when we had a visit, we always tried to get, you know, someone well, the minister then was willing to do it, you know, for like to, um, I mean, not saying that anybody isn't willing now, but then they they were very willing, you know, to, um, to meet with them. And we would, you know, um, there was a film festival, and we would like sponsor a reception, you know, and, and things, things like that. But I had a very blunt conversation with my ambassador and said, basically, like, okay, I, I'm trying to think of a, of a, you know, different polite way of sort of saying this, but and he's like, well, say it. I said, how much ambassador of gay are you willing to be? Yeah, yeah. You know, and it, like, he was quite, he was quite willing. So we, you know, we kept up and we did, um, you know, we did even, even more. The previous ambassador had been a straight woman, but also, you know, very much an ally. Yeah. But it really, you know, it did really help for, I, I think people really appreciated the fact that, you know, he was there, he was out, he was open, he was standing with them, you know, and I felt like we advanced the file there in that time that, uh, that I was there in a way that was harder to do without that. But if he had said, you know, not much, I don't want to be, I don't want this to be a feature of my posting. Right. I think, you know, that's also someone's right, you know? Yeah. And yeah, and it, it really is a case by case basis. And I mean, to a large extent, I mean, what allowed me to do this research, and I talk about this in my book, is because, because I am Canadian, because I am a Canadian Foreign Service officer, I have the freedom to explore these issues in ways that many other diplomats just could not. And, and I mean, they, they suffer, you know, like it, it, it hurts me to think about the, what diplomats, queer diplomats from other countries have to go through. And, you know, <sighs> Sometimes, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but they say sometimes that, you know, um, the Foreign Service is a mecca for gays and lesbians. Um, if you go back into the history, which is fascinating, of our department, you'll see examples of a lot of uh, gay men and lesbians who were not open and they were in the closet and they were often sent to um, uh, isolated postings uh, where they were willing to go and they were open to going there in situations that were quite dangerous for them and where some were compromised, some were killed. I mean, there's a whole 
there's a whole backstory there um, on many cases. Um, and so there, there is this history and now we don't have that silence and, and fear. And so it allows me to kind of explore what diplomats in other countries are going through. And I just feel like um, it's just such a blessing. I mean, I don't think, I mean, I think we need to, it's important to acknowledge homophobia directed at specific diplomats. Uh, and there are uh, some issues that do come up in our department from time to time and they need to be addressed. But I would say the, the main message I would say about working on these issues in my department is I'm struck by how supportive straight people, people who are not LGBT, who don't identify as LGBTQ and who are my colleagues in my department, how, how important it is, uh, the, the important work that they do, they, and they don't do it, um, you know, in some sort of token gesture, they do it because this is part of our foreign policy and it's one of the many things that they promote uh, in terms of Canada's human rights agenda. And I just, I just have so much respect for so many people in my department uh, on that, in that area. Oh, that's good to hear. You know, it's it's good it's good to hear that that is um, that that's working. You know, and that that, yeah. that that you can feel that. I mean, I remember when I was uh, about to join the foreign service. I joined at the tail end of 1993. This is how old I am, um, and I went looking for some books about the life. You know, the day to day life and personal life of foreign service officers, Canadian diplomats, and there was very little at that time. There's still is relatively little, which is something, you know, we at PAFSO are trying to address through Buda Papier and, you know, maybe, I mean, I'm getting ideas as you're, you're talking here thinking, you know, maybe we should do an anthology of like, who are Canadian diplomats and get people to talk about, you know, different people with different sort of identities, you know, coming and talking about what it's meant to them um, to do this in their career. But I remember reading, I found Charles Ritchie's journals, diaries, right? And that was all. And they were from, you know, the 50s at the latest, right? But what I was struck by, and I didn't understand, was all of his conversations, his, his you'd be writing about so and so, and I had dinner with so and so and his va lovely valet. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> and I was like, wow, they're very egalitarian, you know, these Canadian diplomats, like the valets sitting down to dinner and, you know, and, and <laughs> engaging in the conversation. And I didn't realize that that was how they would yeah. host same-sex couples. And it's yeah. funny, but, uh, you know, since I took on this presidency of PAFSO, I see more of our colleagues at Am Canada, Roma, and so on, including some who were retired, like, long before, you know, I was active uh, in any of this and I was talking to one guy and he said but you know it was better he said it actually worked very quite well that system and I was like geez I don't know that it, you know better maybe makes I don't know how your your partner who was the the servant on the on the right. you know, PCF uh, might feel about that. But he said that there was actually quite a lot of support internally, you know, in the department for finding ways to make these things work. And, you know, that's to the credit of those folks. Like in the 50s, the, the whole idea of same sex marriage or, you yeah. know, any of that stuff was, you know. But, but okay, but, but the, the, I, I understand that there were workarounds for people to 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 be with, uh, but you know the downside to that is so much of that was unspoken. It was under the table. It was never discussed. Yeah. And uh, then when push came to shove during the McCarthy era, you know, in Canada, that was we we jumped on the bandwagon and. I would encourage anyone to to read about the LGBT purge uh, that happened yes. where civil servants 
were uh, kicked out of, uh, you know, and, and the RCMP and our own and external affairs, um, it became a witch hunt. And yeah. so it, it was the sort of thing where nudge, nudge, wink, wink, uh, you know, we'll, we'll sort of, if you don't speak up too loudly, we may, if you're lucky, we may tolerate this to yeah. where we are today. And I would frankly, uh, I understand the survival techniques that people had to go through to do what they needed to do in order to live uh, with as much dignity as they possibly could given their situation. Um, but for me, those were not the good old days. And this is- Oh, the, no, no. <laughs> are the good old days. And this is, um, you know, we are blessed to be, I am blessed to be in this country as uh, as as an openly gay man, as a, as a diplomat. I mean, I've just, I've just seen the changes that have happened in my life. And, you know, and just to be here today talking, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to just um, talk about that arc of history as as it's gone by, you know? Well, thank you. It's it's really been been my pleasure, and um, I think this is a really interesting discussion. It's we're, we'll post it on the YouTube channel for you know we're getting a whole bunch of new. Well, you know better than than us. We're getting a whole bunch of new recruits, right? Who yes. have, are about to start their training, and yes. uh, I think this will be a really you know useful thing for for them to watch. I'm just gonna uh, end the recording here. Okay. Stop the recording.